idea. Turns out I will be here tomorrow. I won't be here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I don't have to go to Los Angeles, which is why I'm here today. Well, actually, I was going to be here today anyway, but I got an email yesterday morning at 10 o'clock saying don't come to Los Angeles, which is fine with me. Uh, so I'll be here tomorrow, and I'll be should be here the next Monday after that. But you'll have class in any case. Anybody have any questions? Most no, we'll of you are back. Um, I was going to talk about other metals, but let me finish. Well, let me finish up with composites. Um, we talked about composites on uh, Thursday. They often enhance a few of the properties while degrading other properties. The reason for putting two different materials together is to get improved properties, but you're usually just improving a few of those properties, and you usually end up degrading even more properties than the ones that you improve. And so there's a trade-off inherently in composites compared to monolithic materials. Composites inherently involve more processing steps. You have to make material A, you have to make material B. That's twice as many processing steps. And then you have to combine them, which is a third set of processing steps. So they're inherently more processing steps, and hence they're more costly. Some structures just cannot be built with composites. And it's fine if you're talking spacecraft at $20,000 a pound payload, uh, savings. Um, it's often good if you're talking uh, <coughs> aircraft where you can be talking $200 a pound or more in certain parts of the aircraft uh, savings. But it's really not very practical in most things like automobiles at $2 a pound savings, which reminds me that on last week while I was traveling, I get, on Friday I get an email from some MIT undergraduate telling me that um, MIT undergraduates and students from other universities around the world have decided to take on a project where they will build a vehicle that has two, an automobile, they're going to build it in India, and she was off to India for the summer. Um, they're going to build it in India, it will get 200 miles per gallon, and uh, it will be safer and everything else and there was this new company fiber x i can't remember i guess i could go look at my trash in my email and find it um, uh, that had a new composites manufacturing technique that made better things cheaper and you know blah 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 and so they're going to make these cars out of this stuff and oh by the way if they didn't have any funding could i help help pay support a student out of my pocket i guess um, but, so isn't, isn't youth uh, wonderful to be so enthusiastic and to believe that uh, they can do this? Now, what's the fallacy in, in something like this? Aside from the fact you can't even get a motorcycle that'll give you 200 miles a gallon. Maybe a moped, okay, if you spend a fair amount of your time pedaling, okay, you can only use it for the hills or something to give you a system. But I mean, most motor motorcycles won't give you 200 miles a gallon. What's the other problem with this? Losing your speed roughly equivalent to the square of your power. Yeah, that, I mean, if, if you want to get 200 miles a gallon and you want to go at a snail's pace, literally at a snail's pace, you might be able to do it. The real problem is one that you won't think about because it's not, it's a sociological problem, it's not a technological problem. It assumes, that, that project assumes that all the engineers all over the world who have worked in the automotive business are absolute morons, right? They're going to do something that's 20 times better than any of them have ever thought of, right? So they've, these undergraduates have set themselves up on this pillar. Now, they don't think about it this way, but this is exactly what they're doing. They think that they are so smart that they can outsmart all the engine. You know how many engineers work in the automotive industry? It's probably two million around the world. And all of them are so stupid that they can't figure out how to build a 200 mile per gallon vehicle at one tenth the cost or whatever it is that these people have, right? So just, I mean, I see this all the time. People come up with these <coughs> grandiose ideas and if you say, well, why hasn't anyone ever done this before? You have to presume stupidity absolute, you know, vegetable-like stupidity on the part of all these other people, right? But that's, just remember that, because you too someday will have people coming to you with proposals, okay, 
of how they're going to do things. Okay. Um, I guess I can tell another story. Uh, I probably should. Um, but on, on Thursday, before I was leaving on my trip on Friday, I get an email asking me to review a proposal for a state. And the states are trying to improve jobs. And so this was a multi million dollar proposal to develop a welding machine. I won't tell you what type of welding machine. And they had universities from their state involved and all this other stuff. And the only problem was they needed the, pro the proposal review done by today. Of course, I was going to be out of town on Friday, and I went out to work on Saturday. I agreed to review it. I mean, this was 10 o'clock uh, Thursday morning, and by noon, I had a copy of the proposal. And before I left on my plane, I had actually drafted up, I had read it, and I would reviewed it. And in this particular case, um, the welding equipment involved, um, well, I shouldn't tell you exactly what the stuff is because I have to sign some confidentialities and stuff. But they had done a mechanics analysis and they had missed some of the basic physics, okay? So I was actually pretty excited. I thought this, this was coming from the state where this welding technology was the best in the country. Turns out it came from the salesman who had quit that company. And the salesmen, their only problem is they just didn't understand the technical de details of the equipment. But they were going to build something better than all those stupid engineers back at their company, right? Who had been working on this with tens of millions of dollars worth of Air Force money for about 30 years, right? But they, the salesmen knew how to do it, right? As they talked to a professor at a local university, and he came up with a very clever idea. He just didn't analyze the whole thing. So, anyway. Um, so today we're going to talk about all the other elements in the periodic table, but before I do that, I'm going to show you an example of necessity is the mother of invention, and that is the story of steel in the 1980s. Now, when I went to work for Bethlehem Steel in 1974, they had had their best year, most profitable year ever in 1973, okay? and then. I went to work for them, worked for them for a couple of years, and they've been going downhill ever since. In fact, Bethlehem Steel doesn't exist anymore. But in fact, uh, you have to understand the steel industry and the mentality of the people in the steel industry. After World War II, the United States produced 75% of the steel in the world. We had bombed out all the rest of the steel for making capacity in Europe, Japan, okay? There wasn't a whole lot left, okay? So the guys who were hired into management at U.S. Steel in Bethlehem in 1945, when I went to work for them 30 years later, guess where they were? They were at the top of the company. And they still had this idea that they controlled 75% of the world's steel industry, where in, in fact, they only controlled 25% by 1974, okay? But they still had, I think Bethlehem had three or four corporate jets, and every weekend in the winter they were flying to Florida so these guys could play golf. Okay, I mean you. Should, I remember going only once that I go to the well, the research labs. Anybody here go to Lehigh University? I know anything about Lehigh? Anyway, Lehigh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There's this the the river and the steel mill, and then as you go up the South Mountain, they call it just a hill. On the side is Lehigh University, and at the very top was Bethlehem Steel Homer Research Labs, which they built in 1964. It cost us $600 million. $64, $600 million research lab was really. This was back when steel companies ruled the world. And so we had like 15 buildings, huge buildings up there. And I worked in B building. We had really clever names A, B, C, D. Okay. Um, and I went down to G or H building, wherever the big wood shop. We had a small wood shop in B building where we built, you know, special little wood things for some of the research. But I went down to G or H building once in the two years I was there. And you, you wouldn't believe this beautiful dining room set, okay, made out of cherry or walnut or whatever, is being built there for one of the executives, okay. This is the type of high quality management. Steel. They knew what they wanted for their home, and there was nothing the steel company couldn't afford. Okay. Um, so anyway, the steel industry ran into some hard times in the 1980s, and this is actually <coughs> the U.S. steel industry shipments, 
And it's pretty much constant as you look across here. Uh, forget this recession here in 82, that's just, a, that's just a little scatter. But it turns out for the last 35 years, the United States has used about 100 million tons. Now we were importing about 25 million tons, so that makes the 100 million tons. And over the 1980s, we used the same amount. But the interesting thing, look at the employment. When they had these hard times, they went from half a million to 250,000 people. Now when production stays the same, and employment drops by a factor of two, what happens to productivity? Okay, well, you don't have to be a math major or even take remedial MIT summer math to know that productivity doubles. Ta-da! You divide by half as many people and you double the productivity. So what happened here to make steel go from a lousy productivity, this was probably back in those days four or five person hours a ton. When I worked there in the mid 70s, it was six person hours a ton uh, to make steel. And Bethlehem's raw materials costs were about 45%. Their labor costs were about 45% and their profit was about 10%. Well, by the 1980s or late 80s, worldwide, uh, not worldwide, but best in the world, best in class, was some of the US mini mills that were down to about 1.6 person hours per ton. I mean, just in those 15 years, they had dropped by a factor of four, 75% improvement in productivity in the 1980s, a two-fold improvement in productivity. Well, there were a number of things that happened. Uh, one thing is from 1880, not too long after uh, Sir Henry Bessemer taught us how to get high enough temperatures to melt steel and brought us into the steel age, about 1880, guys like Andrew Carney was the richest man in the world. He was the Bill Gates of his day, okay? Uh, he was worth like $100 million. Uh, that was a lot of money back then. And um, that was the steel, steel industry was growing because of the railroads. They learned, Bethlehem Steel learned how, how to roll I-beams and all of a sudden New York City went from being 10-story maximum buildings to up to 100-story buildings by the 1930s, okay, because it's rolled steel beams. Um, so there were a bunch of interesting innovations in the steel industry, but from 1900, when they might have been making 50 million tons a year to 100 million tons a year in the 1970s, we had been putting about 50 million tons a year of steel into the environment. We got that steel by digging an iron ore out of the Mesabi Range in uh, uh, Minnesota, which was almost pure iron ore. You could, you could basically just crush the rock and put it directly into the blast furnace, okay? There's nowhere in the world that we have iron ore that, that good on that quantity. But by the 1970s, we had mined out the Mesabi Range and we were starting to have to make iron ore different ways with more expensive processing. Um, and that was driving up some of the costs. But nonetheless, um, if you go back to 1600, remember I told you it took about a person year, about 2,000 hours a ton. And technology had brought us to the point to 1975, six hours a ton. And what happened in the 1980s? Well, in the 1980s, um, what had happened is, I remember when I went to work for Bethlehem Steel, they they put us in a room with all the new college grads and they said, we are so efficient. We, they were the second largest steel company, had their most profitable year in 73, and this was in summer of 75. And they said, we are so, so efficient. We have blast furnaces that were built in 1911 and, and, and coke ovens built in 1910. And they're fully depreciated and therefore it cost us nothing to make steel. And I, out of 500 college grads, I would raise my hand and said, excuse me, sir, I don't understand why if something's fully depreci depreciated, it doesn't cost you anything to make it. He says, that's because you don't understand economics or finance or whatever he was vice president of. And I later took a course on finance and learned that, yes, that's true, I didn't understand finance, but neither did he, okay? <laughs> Using antiquated equipment, when the Japanese were building new steel mills, because they had none left after World War II, it took them through the 50s to get enough capital to really build up some steel, steel mills. 
but they were building brand new steel mills in the 1960s, and we were using 1910 technology, right? And so it turns out the U.S. steel industry was dying in the 1980s, and uh, someone came along with an idea in the 60s, or well, actually in the 60s, but they really implemented it in the, in the <coughs> 70s, called mini mills. And the mini mills, everyone had made steel out of iron ore, but for about 80 years, we've been putting about 50 million tons a year of steel into the environment. And when this stuff was past its useful life, you had about four or five billion tons of steel scrap sitting out there. And it turns out you can melt steel scrap for $100 a ton, or you can make take iron ore and coal and make cast iron to make steel for about $200 a ton. So what's the better business? To use scrap to make steel or to dig ore out of the ground? Well, these guys in the mini mills, not playing golf every weekend in, in Florida, like the management at Bethlehem Steel, came up with this idea. What if we used 100% scrap and used electric furnaces rather than basic oxygen furnaces? Well, they did, and all of a sudden the mini mills started making garbage variety steel. And the garbage variety steel they made was reinforcing bar for concrete. That was the first stuff. And they just kept on moving up and up and up the value chain and eating at the bottom of the steel industry's profits, okay? The low value stuff, the guys, the guys golfing down in Florida didn't care about. They didn't care about the low value stuff. But the mini mills were making money on it the big steel mills couldn't make money on it, so they let them have it. And they just kept on getting something a little better and a little better until the mid-80s, they were actually making better structural steel than Bethlehem's bread and butter of structural steel. Um, and there's a book written by Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School called The Innovator's Dilemma. And it sort of is an apology for these golfers in Florida um, of how they couldn't see the new technology of the mini mills coming along because they were too busy golfing. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say they were golfing. He said they were too busy turning out better products. Well, it wasn't better products, and I could go through that, but uh, they, were, they were busy golfing. But what happened is the mini mills, um, one of the ways they got into the structural steel business is you continuously cast steel if you want to make money nowadays. That's another story about how the old guys So these are, ordinarily you can't continuous cast a rectangular beam. These are early versions of beams that were not rectangular, but they already had approximately the same, or beginning shape, a dog bone shape of an I-beam. And in fact, a later technology, this comes from Chaparral Steel, a mini mill down in Texas. This is the continuous cast beam. At this point, the dog bone is getting, you can barely see that, but sorry. Um, if I take it out, it make better out of, the, out of the jack. Is this continuous casting similar to uh, an extrusion type process? Pardon me? Is it similar to a, an extrusion type process? Yeah, except for pouring liquid metal into a mold, and it just kind of comes out in the shape of the mold, okay? The molds typically used to be round or rectangular, but these guys went to dog bone shaped molds. And that one's really not showing up very well. Uh, wait a second, let me go to transmission mode. Let me figure this out. Uh, somewhere on here. Okay, sorry. So this is the I-beam in a little bit later technology. They kept on improving those dog bone shapes until they actually got shapes that almost looked like an I-beam. And actually you can see this thing cooling. You 
is still red hot in some parts and it's got a mill scale in other parts. But it turns out they went from typically Bethlehem Steel to make an I beam had something like 21 passes uh, in the rolling mill to go from a rectangular bloom, they call them, ingot, you want to think of it like, like that, to a uh, uh, a uh, mini mitten to uh, an I beam and, and uh, Chaparral got it down to like six passes, tremendous increase in productivity. Then there's another thing that happened. This story, actually, this one might show up all right with upside down lighting, upside down, too bright. Um, So Bethlehem, not Bethlehem, but Chaparral had some guys, and one of the things that Chaparral, they had profit sharing. You go to Chaparral twice a week, they post the profitability of the company, and every employee is sharing in those profits, and they know how much extra money they made that week. And so they don't waste money like they did at Bethlehem Steel. But they used to also send the, the operators out with the salespeople once a year and so these guys were making this garbage reinforcing bar, and they learned that the 3 8 inch diameter bar, number three re rebar, number half half inches, four eighths, number four, it goes by eighths, okay, got a 20% premium in price. Well, 20% premium is like doubling your profit. And so they decided, these operators decided, well, we're gonna go out and we're gonna corner the market on 3 8 inch diameter reinforcing bar rather than the bigger stuff because that's where the money is, that's where the profit is. <coughs> and those, so they tried to run their steel, their steel mill faster and they couldn't do it, other, just like anywhere else. All those other people who had run steel mills before them were not completely stupid. They had tried to run faster. So the point here is the guys at Chaparral thought, well, let's head in the opposite direction. Let's run it slower. But we're gonna split the, the incoming ingot bar, hot bar, into two. We're going to run slower, but we're going to split it in two while we're doing it. And after we split it in two, we're going to split it in two again oops, and have four bars coming out of one mill. So you might be running half as fast, but you're producing four times as many bars. You doubled your productivity, okay, by running slower rather than faster. So Chaparral cornered the cheap rebar market and made a lot of money while all the American mills were losing money. So a lot of times, working smarter means not necessarily being more brilliant than someone else. It usually means thinking in the opposite direction <coughs> of where everyone else is thinking, okay? Uh, and in fact, I've sort of made my research career by not wanting to work on what everyone else was working on, whether it be nanotechnology or biotechnology or high temperature superconductors, because I actually believe there are a lot of smart people out there and I don't want to compete with smart people. Okay, I want to compete with stupid people. <laughs> but it's just, so I would always go and try to find something that no one else wanted to work on, because it's easier to find a, a gem in a field that's been completely unplowed, rather than trying to go through a field that's been plowed a hundred times. Any rubies that are out there in that field are probably already going to be turned over by some other farmer. Okay, but if you go out in a field that's never been plowed before, you have a better chance of finding something useful. So, but to tell you the truth, most of what I see in the world is people trying to copy other people, rather than trying to come up with their own ideas. And you don't have to be brilliant to come up with your own ideas, you just have to think a little bit. So those are <coughs> some of the principles or whatever. So let's talk about stainless steels. Let me go back to, I can get the upper lights on. Open this up a little bit. So this is um, a map of the stainless steel, all the stainless steels in the world. We're gonna get to other materials here in a little bit. This comes out of Cedric's book on corrosion of stainless steels. There are dozens of books on stainless steels. And one of the things that was very helpful to me in my career was also kind of this necessity being the mother of invention. The steel industry is 
were dying, and so some people had to think a little bit differently. Uh, I actually bought a house back in 1978, same one I live in now, that I couldn't afford, okay? It's a long story. My mother-in-law needed to move in with us, and so we bought a house when I couldn't afford it. And so I had to go work for a, a firm down here, starting about 79, um, while well, I was still a faculty member, but I would go down there two or three days a month, and I would do their failure analyses. And um, so I, I might, well, I was probably doing, these were industrial failures. Some company had a widget and broke, and they wanted to know, was it fatigue? Was it, why, why did it break so it wouldn't break again? So I was doing like <coughs> 10 failures a day. I mean, I'd go down there and I'd look at these things. And I learned a lot, just got, gained a lot of experience by looking at things. And one of the things I learned was that 95% of all metals made are steel. Most of what I was working on is steel. Sometimes I'd do some copper, some aluminum, but most of what I did was steel. But stainless steel, which is only about 2% of all state of steel made, accounted for 30% of the problems, okay? Why? Because stainless steel is a higher value steel. It's corrosion resistant. Most people think it's, it won't corrode at all, right? And people would bring in a piece of rusty looking steel that says, this is supposed to be stainless, but it's all rusty. And I take a magnet to it. It's the first thing you do, take a magnet, and if it's non-magnetic, fair chance it's stainless. Um, if it is magnetic, it could still be stainless. But I had to, I've had to, I don't know how many times I've had to explain to people in my life, stainless steel can also rust. In fact, if you want it to rust, all you have to do is stick it in hydrochloric acid and take off the protective chromium oxide skin. Stainless steel was discovered in the early 1900s, just a little over 100 years ago, when a guy was added some chromium. And if you get more than about 12% chromium in stainless steel, the surface oxide is not an iron oxide, chromium oxide. Chromium oxide is a lot more stable than iron oxide. You will form essentially a 100% chromium oxide surface. And that gives excellent water corrosion resistance, as long as there's no chlorides around. And it also gives very good high temperature properties. So stainless steels have excellent high temperature properties and they have excellent uh, corrosion resistance uh, as long as there's not a lot of chlorides. If there are a lot of chlorides, then you can have some real problems. And unfortunately, I don't have the samples anymore, but I had to go over here to, to Everett once to uh, a hot dog factory where they make Fenway Franks, okay? <coughs> and they have this, they have the First, they have their meat liquefiers. That's what they call them, liquefiers. They take whatever it is, you know, the, the heads, the tails, you know, the hooves, and they throw it all into this meat liquefier, and this goo comes out. That's your hot dog. <laughs> then they add a lot of salt, okay? And then they stick them in the casings, and then they hang them from racks, and they put them through this oven to cook them. And it's sort of a tunnel, and it's larger than your home, unless you're but um, it's a very big oven. And the problem they had was the stainless steel was crumbling to pieces in this thing. And they had had this oven for years, but they had had some parts of it rebuilt. And it was all supposed to be a particular grade of stainless steel called 316. The basic grade of stainless steel that most people know about is 304, and that's iron, 18, 19 chrome, 10 nickel. Sometimes you see 1810 stainless or 18.8 stainless, that's 304 stainless. That is 45% of all the stainless steel in the world. It's the basic th alloy that was invented in 1908 or 1905 or whatever it was. But if I want to get pinning resistance in chlorides, I add 2% molybdenum, okay, moly, um, to the stainless steel, and that gives excellent pinning resistance. The hot dog cooker was supposed to be made out of 316 stainless, because there's lots of salt in the hot dogs. But some of the pieces they had made out of 304, and the 304 was just falling apart in your hands. It was it's a little bit rusty, but in the grain bag, just being completely eaten away. It was one of the most dramatic things for only a 2% difference in the composition, okay? Now, if you get to something that's really salty, like seawater, there's 317, which has 4% molybdenum. Now, you have to understand, 304 stainless steel might cost you today 
$4,000 a ton, $2 a pound. Okay, I used to use a dollar a pound, but prices have gone up in recent years. So $2,000 a ton, you're probably talking $6,000 a ton to add 2% molybdenum. Molybdenum's not cheap, okay? Uh, it might be a tripling of price. And so if you go to 317, you might be talking $10,000 a ton. $10,000 a ton is getting to be up there with nickels and, and other things. This is actually used, 317, the largest use I know of is for medical, some medical implants, things that go in the body. Because the blood is just as salty as seawater. When I was in third grade, they taught me that that's proof that we came from the ocean, okay, that our blood has the same salinity as seawater, okay? And then there's something called the super austenitic stainless steels that have 6% molybdenum. Anybody know <coughs> what the US Navy wants to use super austenitic stainless steels for? Next generation submarine, okay? They can't afford titanium, plus they never solved this creep fatigue interaction with titanium. And they have a real problem with these big, long magnetic objects in the water. They're too easy to find. It's one of the uses of high temperature superconductors. You're gonna be able to fly over the ocean with, with a, certainly in a plane, and maybe you can project into the future, although the future may be here for all I know. Um, in a spacecraft and have a high temperature superconductor in there and you would be able to see the magnetic signature of a big long ferritic steel object. So a super austenitic is a non-ferromagnetic <coughs> stainless but you have to go to six percent molybdenum to keep it from falling apart long term in all the corrosive effects of hot seawater in the tropics and things like that. So the Navy's looking at, has started spending a lot of money to offer their research looking at super austenitic stainless steels, which comes down this tree of the stainless steels. Now we also have low carbon versions of 304, 316, and 317. It turns out most of your nuclear reactors that were built by General Electric, the boiling water reactors, commercial grade nuclear reactors, were built of 304 stainless steel. They needed something that was corrosion resistant. They had the world's purest water. If you were to take hydrogen, pure hydrogen, pure oxygen, combine it to make water, uh, one of you guys is a no right? You, several of us are. Okay, <laughs> several of you are, okay. How do you refer to the conductivity of the, the water for purity? Zero micromoles per centimeters. Right, but you know what 18 megaohm water is? No, oh, that would be the resistivity to resistivity, current. Okay. Yeah. 18 megaohm water is absolutely pure H2O, okay? No impurities whatsoever. When we, we don't talk about parts per billion or parts per trillion, when you get to absolutely pure, you talk about 18 megaohm water. You can't get any higher resistivity of water than 18 megaohms, okay? That's the resistivity of H2O. So any impurities will be a problem. It turns out General Electric in the mid 70s all of a sudden they built a lot of these reactors around the world and they had cracking problems around the wells and it, they had about a two billion dollar problem and it turns out that the corrosion problem in 304 wells had to do with the fact you form uh, and they were using 304L but in 304 people learned in the oh the 1940s that you would precipitate out chromium carbides. There's, there's 0.03 to 0.08% carbon in that 304L, and that 304. And if you get to an 800 to 1200 degree Fahrenheit temperature range, which you do if you're welding something, or you certainly if you stress relieve it, you will get chromium carbides to precipitate at the grain boundary. When they do that, we'll talk about this maybe some later, they end up carbon will diffuse very well in the steel, the chromium diffuses more slowly, and you will denude, you will essentially reduce the chromium content at the grain boundaries. I've measured it as low as 8% chrome, rather than 18% chrome. Well, 8% chrome means it's no longer corrosion resistant in water, and you'll just eat away the grain boundaries. This so, is the knife line effect you're talking about, or it happens? It's like a knife line, yes. Knife line actually refers to the weld, but it is this, the knife line is not the corrosion of the grain boundary, but whole grain boundaries 
creates a knife line. Knife lines are a little, uh, like, a hundred times larger scale. But I, had, I didn't bring the book, but I'll try to remember to bring the book tomorrow and show you a picture of knife line corrosion. About a millimeter or two away from the fusion line, you'll see this corrosion where the steel got in the heat affected zone to 800 to 1200 degrees. And it just corrodes right there because you've, you've lowered the chromium content of the grain boundaries by forming chrome carbides. And this you've, is, you've made a galvanic cell with the rest of what you made? Yep. And in fact, my thesis advisor's thesis advisor, who used to have my office when I was a freshman, had a patent in the 1940s to make stainless steel powder. You just stick it in the furnace, 304, stick it in the furnace in this temperature range, stick it in nitric acid overnight, and you'll end up with powder. Because it just eats away the grain boundaries, and you have single crystal powder. Okay? That was the patent of John Wolfe's in the 1940s. Well, people learn if you got the carbon down to less than 0.03, you could weld and you had less chance of getting knife line. Okay? Not, not zero chance, but less chance. And they thought that was the solution. <coughs> to get the carbon down very low was very expensive. Until 1956 or so in the basement of this building that you're sitting in, uh, a guy, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, uh, working for John Chipman, uh, was looking at trying to purify stainless steels and he found that if you bubbled argon through the stainless steel, you could take carbon monoxide out with the argon. And he came up with a process, um, which he then later went to work for Jessup Steel. And Jessup Steel perfected the process. It's called argon oxygen decarburization, okay, AOD. And virtually all the steel in the world today is made by AOD. And so you can get 304L for basically the same price as 304 nowadays. Okay, by just bubbling argon through the molten steel invented right here in this building. Okay? But MIT didn't get the patent, Jessup still got the patent. But everybody in the world since the 1960s makes stainless steel by AOD today. And you can make 316L, 317L, which are just lower carbon to reduce sensitization of the stainless steel. Now General Electric's problem is they were using 304L and no one believed they were just completely shocked. And you had some pretty sophisticated metallurgists in General Electric. But everyone in the mid-70s was completely shocked to find that you could get stress corrosion cracking in 304L wells in reactor water. But it wasn't just reactor water. It wasn't really 18 megaohm water. It was 18 megaohm water that had about 100 parts per billion of chlorine, which is not very much. And on shutdown, it would have one or two parts per million oxygen. And that little bit of chlorine and oxygen, parts per million, or tenths of a part per million of chlorine, was sufficient to cause stress corrosion cracking if the steels had lots of residual stresses from the welding. Okay? It cost General Electric $2 billion and in the late 70s, a tremendous amount of research done on stress corrosion cracking in austenitic stainless steels. Uh, so it can occur in extremely pure water. So what are the, what are the reactors doing nowadays to have prevent hydrogen. this? They have hydrogen. They have hydrogen. When? On shutdown, right? Well, no, it's always there. Well, it's always there, but primarily it's for shutdown. You, you, you have, there's just certain limits that you have to meet based on the temperature range that you're in. So right. as you're shutting down and cooling down, you have to adjust hydrogen I mean, concentration so it'll scavenge you oxygen. In general, when the, when the water's hot, the oxygen gets driven off. Yep. So when, the, when you're at operating temperature, you don't have to worry about having a little oxygen in the steel. Generally, it comes off. But um, there were, if you get back to the whole problem of stress corrosion cracking, I drew the Venn diagram the other day. You've got <coughs> um, a stress. You have a corrosive environment. And then you have a susceptible material. So General Electric wasn't stupid. They thought by using 304L, they were getting rid of the susceptible material. And they thought because they were in the world's purest water environment, they'd gotten rid of any corrosive effects. They knew they had residual stresses from welding. They didn't really worry about that because they had taken care of two of these three things and minimized those, so they thought. And to everyone in the world's surprise, it, 
took even with 304L and even with extremely pure water, but little bits of oxygen and chlorine, they actually could get stress corrosion cracking. So to solve the problem, well, they went and they developed new steels for new reactors, and so now they have 304LN, uh, actually ELN, I think it is, it might be, where because of the AOD, AOD process, they can get down to even lower carbon, so that's extra low carbon. But then when you get the little bit of carbon out of there, the steel doesn't have the full strength that it used to have, so they actually add some nitrogen to the steel. So there's another grade that's not even in Cedric's book. Um, so they actually have improved the material. And this stuff, even in the, the water contam I'll call it contaminated, but this is purer than, than anything you're going to drink, okay? Uh, water doesn't corrode the stuff. But what, and they also, when they built new things, they developed techniques. These would be on big pipes where they had the worst residual stresses, and they, they would make the root pass on the pipe. And then they would fill the pipe with water because they now have a small pass. And by welding on a piece of steel that's got water on the inside, they change the residual stress pattern, and they get compressive residual stresses on the inside of the pipe rather than tensile. And therefore, you have compressive stresses, and you don't get stress for the crack. So essentially, you, if you think of your joint, here's your original joint. You make that pass, and then you fill up the inside of the pipe with water. Now, there's another one down here, right? Then you fill it up with water, and then you put all your other passes on. And this might be a one and a half inch thick piece of stainless steel 30 inches in diameter. And if you weld it this way, you don't end up with tensile residual stresses because the water on the inside changes the heat flow pattern and you get compressive residual stresses on the surface. So that's another technique they used. Okay, so they used a process change to get favorable stresses. They used a material change to get rid of the susceptibility. And then they also changed the environment so that when they shut down on commercial reactors, they have this big vacuum pump that pulls the oxygen out of the water. Now, you're right, the Navy uses hydrogen, but you don't really use hydrogen, you use hydrazine, right? No. When shut down, yes. When shut down, yes. Yeah, use both. Use both, okay. Yeah. Hydrazine is H2N2, if I remember correctly. It's very expensive, only the Navy can afford it, okay? You may use hydrogen in operation, I didn't know that, okay? But um, I doubt that's classified. But all you're doing is you put hydrogen in the water when you're operating, you're lowering the oxygen potential. Put it in a neutron flux and it's going to react. Right, okay. Water. The hydrazine, when you shut down, when you're sitting at dock working on the reactor, they put hydrazine in there as a continual source of renewing that hydrogen. No matter how much oxygen gets in there from whatever screw up, you, it's like continually bleeding hydrogen in, okay? But hydrazine is a fairly, very, well, it's hard to contain. And, Anyway, it's an expensive material to use. The Navy's the only people I know that use it. Most commercial reactors just have a big vacuum pump and they, they have a vessel so the water circulates through this vacuum vessel and they suck the oxygen out of the, you know. If you wanted to, if you wanted to make a flat um, Sprite, all you have to do is put it in a vacuum vessel and suck all the CO2 out, right? You can suck all the oxygen out of the, the water. The fish will die <coughs> they don't have oxygen to breathe. But you won't have corrosion. So, General Electric found for new construction they could change the material, they could change the stress. For old construction, about all they could do was change the environment. But whatever you do, actually nowadays for reactors you do everything. Okay, you can't afford to have problems. So with stainless steels, we have the superoxidetics. These are. These represent probably more than 50% of all the stainless steels used. Now, we also have things that we take the nickel out, and we have 403, 410, and 420. 410, typically, there's, if you have stainless steel mufflers in your car, has some oxidation resistance. You don't care whether it's magnetic or not. So, it's cheap, okay? Actually, 409 is really, where's 409 on here? It may not be on here. But 409 is, is a, not necessarily Martin City, it's ferritic. Well, I guess you could go up this way. 
there are five different types of stainless steel. There's austenitic, and these are your super austenitics. There's ferritic, so this is body center, this is face center cubic, this is body center cubic. This is magnetic, so just because you take a magnet to something and find it's magnetic doesn't mean it's not stainless. If you take a magnet to a piece of steel and find out it's not stainless, the odds are that it is, um, that it is non-magnetic, the odds are it is stainless. Um, right here, I guess I didn't say this, we sometimes add uh, <coughs> titanium or niobium and tantalum, which are 321 and 347. Back in the old days, before the guy in the basement learned how to do AOD, they would add titanium or niobium and tantalum to tie up the carbon. These things are very strong carbide formers and they could tie up the carbon when you had higher amounts of carbon. We still use these in some applications. Um, if you go up here, the ferritic stainless steels, 430, and then the super ferritics, a uh, little bit cheaper because they don't have the expensive nickel, um, but the super ferritics have like 30% chrome in molly, okay? Uh, very good for condensing steam, for example. I put a boiler in my house, you know, a hot water heater in my house at one time, and the, this was 30 years ago, but this was new technology back then to essentially condense the steam in your boiler rather than putting all the hot gas up the stack with all the moisture from burning the, in my case, natural gas, but whether it's coal or whatever. But you're exhausting four, five, six hundred degree air, which is what you like to have heat your house. Well, back in the late 70s, people developed technologies, so you actually had boilers that would help condense that steam so it would be saturated steam. And you could actually you can actually exhaust it out the side of your house rather than up the stack because you cool it down low enough that saturated steam is really not much worse. You don't want to breathe it, but it's not much worse than re breathing the exhaust from a hot water dryer, uh, from a, a dryer for your clothes. Um, and so they were going to do it and they were just going to exhaust it out the side of my house and I was going to have the steam cloud going up two stories on the side of my house and it turns out to be the front of the house. I said, well, can't you just use my old fireplace? And do that. He said, "Oh, but we'd have to line it with ferritic, super ferritic stainless steel because super ferritic was the only." But they didn't tell me super ferritic. They said we have to use this very expensive steel. Blah 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 blah. Well, I happen to know it was super ferritic, 29% chrome, and they wanted. This was 30 years ago. They wanted three thousand dollars to line a two-story chimney with this stuff. So I was exhausting out the front, and I had this little steam cloud from the winter going up in front of my house. Uh, but I get good heat efficiency. Um, that's fairly common for boilers to have that now. But if you want to pipe it up and you've got condensing steam, you've got to use ferritic stainlesses. Uh, up this way, you go to high chrome and nickel and you get to things like 310 or 330. 330, it's got 30% chrome, 20% nickel. It's, it's only about half iron, but it's very good high temperature strength. They use it as furnace parts, okay, inside furnaces and stuff. 310 has excellent flame <coughs> resistance. If you go even higher, you get to what we call the Inconels, where it's really more nickel than it is iron. And the Inconels are very expensive because they have all this nickel and chrome in them. If you go up this way, you can add sulfur or selenium that helps with machinability. Terrible for welding, okay? Causes hot cracking in the welds, but excellent for breaking up the chips uh, when you're machining. So typically, a lot of bar that you bar stock you'll buy will be a variation of 304 that has sulfur or selenium, but you try to weld to it and it creates problems. It's great for consulting. People come in with broken welds and I say, oh, on bar stock, I say, have you analyzed it? Do you know you have 304 rather than 303? And most times they have 303. Um, now this way, the martensitic stainless steels typically used when you need high hardness like bearings, stainless steel bearings, or ball bearings, or roller bearings. Medical instruments, need good scissors or things like that that are hard. Um, if you add manganese and nickel rather than, or manganese and nitrogen, you get to the 202, 201 and 202. If you take out all the nickel and most of the chrome, you end up with what you call Hadfield's manganese steel. Austenitic, non-magnetic, not corrosion resistant particularly, but you cannot touch it with a file or a hacksaw. They use it to make prison bars. Okay. 
okay? No hacksaw will go through it. You will dull that hacksaw before you cut through it. So we just have to give the prisoners a bunch of hydrogen, is that? They need a plasma torch to cut the uh, Mathfield's manganese. That's gonna be really susceptible to hydrogen in prisoners, aren't they? All the hydrogen. Oh, no, no, it's austenitic. Uh, and the austenitic can tolerate a lot more. Oh, I thought it was a 200. Sorry, yeah. It, it says 200, well, 200 is actually an austenitic grade. Oh, I thought it was just 300 that was austenitic. No, no, 300 is austenitic. Um, Yes, 300 is austenitic, 200 is also austenitic. Um, the, uh, the, the duplex stainless steels are actually a mixture of austenitic and ferritic, have very good corrosion resistance, some things like CO2. Uh, better resistance to hydrogen, for example, the launch catapults on an uh, 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 aircraft carrier for launching the, the planes. The hydraulic cylinders are made out of duplex stainless steel. High strength, fair corrosion resistance, um, particularly in a salt water environment. Um, very high strength and good corrosion resistance, okay, the duplex stainless. And precipitation hardening is sort of a, these are sort of a cross between austenitic and ferritic. The only ferritics on here are these and these, okay, going on these axes. These are partially ferritic. The precipitation hardening, you can get 200 KSI out of these steels some cases. Very high strength, fair corrosion resistance, uh, is good or uh, basically as good as 304 in most cases. Um, one place that the Navy uses that is uh, on propellers on uh, uh, hydrofoils and things like that, or, or the foils, you know, the, the legs on the hydrofoil, where you need very high strength. So anyway, stainless steels have a reasonable market, a couple million tons. It's one-tenth that of aluminum. Aluminum is about 20 million tons. But as I said before, when you look at failures, the stainless steels account for about, in my opinion, 15 times as many failures on a per ton basis as regular steels, okay? Because people put them in applications that are very demanding, very high corrosion resistance, and the stainless steels, I mean, just changing from a 304 to 316 and making hot dogs makes a world of difference, okay? So there's a lot of just plain experience. And the typical thing they do at chemical plants is if they have a chemical plant that's running and they have corrosion problems, they'll try some new material and take a coupon and they'll hang it in a pipe somewhere, okay? and just put it in the process stream and see if it corrodes. Now one of the problems is there's so many different types of corrosion. So you can hang the thing unstressed and it'll work just fine. If you put a U-bend, bend it in a U, put a bolt through it so it's got stress at the bottom of the U and put it in there, you might get stress corrosion cracking like that. And I've got an example, it wasn't in seals, it was actually in plexiglass. Uh, and I needed to do a demonstration of a refrigerator, a liquid ammonia refrigerator, but I want to use liquid ammonia because it's toxic. Um, at least if you get it in your lungs, you get ammonium hydroxide in your lungs. It starts eating your span. Okay. Um, if you breathe ammonia gas, you'll get ammonium hydroxide in your lungs, okay? And it's not good. Um, and so I wanted to do a, a demo of a refrigerator, so we made most of it out of copper, but we had the end so we could see the liquid in there, we made it out of plexiglass, and I didn't know if plexiglass would tolerate tef uh, not Teflon, but the uh, fluorinated the fluorinated hydrocarbons, okay, freons, the freons, are not, so I took some freon, and I stuck, I stuck the uh, plexiglass in there for a couple of days before we, we built this thing, this was 25 years ago, and everything's fine, no problem, so we, we build it, all out of copper and, and plexiglass, and we go and we pressurize this little freon refrigerator, and within minutes you can see cracks growing in the plexiglass. Plexiglass is resistant to freon when it's not stressed, but it causes stress corrosion. Freon causes stress corrosion in plexiglass. So we learned that well real quick, so I went and then looked it up in the literature and found out that we could use polycarbonate or something. I don't remember. We ended up rebuilding it. 
waste of the week. Yeah. So what do you think of the chances of the Navy getting the super austenitic seals to work for submarine hulls? So they were doing a lot of research into that. Well, if you want to go from $4,000 a ton to $16,000 a ton, so that you're, if you're going to build, I don't know, I haven't heard numbers on, what's the class now? It's not 688. Virginia class, there you go. That's right, I can't remember the, doesn't have a number to it, right? It's got a name, okay? Why, who would not remember a name, right? Um, the Virginia class, I don't know, you know, I, I don't, the Sea Wolf I used to work on a little bit, and I know that that was an 18,000 ton vessel, and the whole, whole mechanical, uh, the whole part of the whole mechanical electrical was 500 million of 2 billion, or whatever the Sea Wolf was gonna cost. So, if you go to a super austenitic, uh, the fabrication costs may not go up by a factor of four. They may only go up by a factor of two. So you're now talking a billion dollars for your hull of your HME, right? Now, H well, maybe HME was all 500 million and all the warheads and everything else was what brought it to two billion. I don't remember, you know, it's been 20 years, <coughs> 25 years. Um, but you're talking substantial increases in price. Uh, maybe adding a one-third or so in increase in cost. Going to a material that's four times as expensive, but going to a cost that's a third more. And so then you have to ask, well, if you're gonna buy, build six ships, would you have to have six ships or eight ships? Okay, that gets to be a strategic decision. Kind of come from the program, the answer is no. Trying to get to two billion, two billion in submarine the cost of materials, it's not going to happen. Right, okay. They're well, trying not to cut costs for Virginia now. class. You would have to completely redesign the submarine to make it out of austenitic for one yeah. thing, okay? So it wouldn't be the Virginia class, but I mean, I, I mean, having come from the program office, I could have told you that anyway. And when I saw the Office of Naval Research trying to do this, they're supposed to be looking to push the envelope. But sometimes I think they're pushing the envelope at things that I mean, you couldn't afford the $2 billion submarine, so who's going to be able to afford the 2 dollars or $3 billion submarine? Because it really gets down to Congress is not going to give you more money. You're just going to have fewer ships. You know? But just think of all the money you'll save on Manning. And just think of all the national security you'll save. I mean, no, that's not safe. <laughs> is, is there any... Obviously, each one of the steels that you showed had various good properties right. associated with it. Um, is there a way that you can take multiple layers, either with a hot roll bonding process or something, to where you can you can layer these steels together to com almost like a your composite. your composites yep. in order to <coughs> achieve yep. the uh, properties of, of all of them. You make a bunch of galvanic cells in there. Well, yes and no. It depends on how you design it. Okay, but what you're talking about is basically clad steel technology, which yep. has been around for 50 years, used very extensively in the chemical process industry. Okay. So can you do it? Yes. And if you go over, uh, well, I spent 19, the mid 80s over in Japan, and I saw them building steel vessels where you, you can't afford to make a stainless steel pressure vessel that's six inches thick of stainless steel. So what you do is you make it six inches thick of carbon steel or pressure vessel steel, and then you put a half inch layer of stainless steel or Inconel. And you might do that by a weld overlay, a cladding process. And that could be a fusion process. Or alternatively, in World War II, we learned about explosive bonding to make clad steels. And what had happened is, we found a number of things that happened in World War II, but they actually found two plates that had been welded together that had never been welded together. And it turns out if you bring things together with like a five to 15 degree angle and an explosion hits one against the other, and they close together like that, you get an explosion bond, and when you take the other part of the course, I'll mention explosive bonding. Uh, but they found it because they found plates that were not together after an explosion, they've been welded together. So afterwards, DuPont, which is, you know, that's how DuPont made all their money, okay, uh, in the Revolutionary War, by making gunpowder, okay? Uh, gun, DuPont originally was an explosives company. And if you look at where most of the explosives are made in the United States, it's all in the Delaware, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania area. And no one else can build an explosion plant because nobody wants to have a new explosive 
plant in their backyard, and so all these things have been licensed before. And I once had a, an explosion occurred in one of these plants in eastern Pennsylvania, and I had to read that I read this history of explosions since the Revolutionary War. It turns out in the explosives building business, they have a major <coughs> explosion every four years. It doesn't matter. Going back 200 years, I mean, it's it's almost like clockwork. You know, you average over 20 years, you have about five explosions, okay? Uh, and it, the, the safety's gotten better, but the explosives have gotten more sophisticated too, okay? And so you blow up a plant every five years, every four or five years, okay? Uh, I remember going out once to, uh, in uh, the ejection for uh, for uh, the for fighter jets. They don't use electrical things that would open up the the the, uh, the dome of the you know the cockpit dome, and you don't want to blast through the cockpit dome because it is made of bulletproof glass. And if you you know fire your explosive you know thing and you try to go through that, it'll just crush you against it, right? You won't break it. So they actually use explosive bolts because all you have to do is have a mechanical per per percussion to set them off and they don't fail. If you lose your electrical system and everything was electrical, you wouldn't be able to, to eject, okay? They have the same thing on the, the space shuttle. They use explosive bolts to break, you know, when the, when the main fuel tank breaks away from everything else and stuff. So I went out to one of these plants and they were for some fighter jet, they were trying to, the Air Force was trying to reduce the weight, and they had made them out of stainless steel. These just little tubes and fittings that they had laser welded together, easy to laser weld steel. They wanted to reduce the weight, worth uh, aircraft, uh, Air Force aircraft, to be a thousand dollars a pound. They wanted to reduce the weight by making these little tubes that went around to cause the ejection and stuff. They wanted to re make them out of aluminum, and they were having problems with laser welding. So I go out to San, San Luis, it wasn't San Luis Obispo, but it was one of the, out in California, you know, the, they built all these missions, you know, from Los Angeles up to San Francisco, San, San Ber, Santa Barbara, and San Bernardino, and not to San Bernardino, but anyway, the, I can't remember which one of these, it was near, near Gilroy, because I remember it's the first time I saw all the garlic fields in California, and um, so they were out there in the middle of nowhere, which is where you build an explosives plant. And here was the plant down the side of the hill and up on the top of the hill, about you know, a third of a mile away, was the plant where they actually made it, okay? And they nothing else around it for a third of a mile except garlic fields or whatever, because uh, who cares if you blow up some garlic, right? Uh, but that's why you do it, because every four years, the explosives business tries to put themselves out of business. Okay. I thought they were uh, getting away from cladding things because at that point you're cladding the anode and you if you get a hole in the cladding, you have a you have a surface area problem. problem where it just eats away. That's what happened at that one BWR where they were being held together by the cladding at that point. Yep. But in a chemical plant they top they, they monitor those things. Uh, <coughs> I don't know that well, I haven't heard that people want to build military ships out of clad material, but the Navy does, anyway, there, there are two explosive plants. DuPont worked on the explosive bonding. There's a, a firm, I think DuPont's out of business. They had some valley in Pennsylvania. They used to do it. There's a firm called Explosive Fabricators just north of Golden, Colorado. They have their own little valley. And they will explosion clad one steel, or one material on top of another. They might make tantalum clad steel. Tantalum, there's a piece of tantalum. Tantalum had excellent corrosion resistance, particularly in Concentrate sulfuric acid, okay? And pervium. And it's worth more than silver, okay, on a per pound basis. And it's very heavy. It's almost as dense as platinum. Uh, so when you can't afford to do something, you do clad it. But one of the reasons to go to super austenitic is you want to get rid of the ferritic seal, okay? You're trying to get rid of the, the only reason to go to super austenitic is to get rid of the magnetic signature, right? And frankly, who out there, other than the Chinese, is going to be able to find our submarine by satellite? The Soviets can't even afford to plot and get up there to put satellites into orbit, right? I mean, it, I, there are all kinds of other questions, okay? But you can clad things. You're absolutely right. And they do, all the time, clad things. But you have to be careful how you clad it. Give an example. When you put 
a um, corrosion resistant material on top of another material. The example I always like to give is my old thesis advisor used to consult for the medical business and some doctor came up with this idea of gold plating stainless steel in, for implants in the body. This is before people were using tantalum and titanium okay, for going in the body. This is back in the 60s and 70s, probably in the 70s, um, early 70s. And they were trying to use stainless steel and the stainless steel would corrode the body. And there's an implant they give to primarily children called a hydrocephalic shunt. So if you have hydrocephalus, water on the brain, um, they have a little a little valve they implant with a, a, a tube that goes to your stomach. And as the fluids build up and the pressure on the brain and the, and the, uh, the young child, or could be an adult, I guess, nowadays, feels a little pressure, they all they have to do is kind of press on their skull and they'll open up this valve and they'll drain some of the fluid into their stomach. And so these things were corroding and they didn't have a life and they'd have to replace them every few years. So this MD came up, well, gold has excellent corrosion resistance and it's non-toxic. In fact, you get gold injections for arthritis, for example. It's expensive, but it works, I guess. And so um, they called up Bob, my thesis advisor, and said, what do you think about this idea? He said, terrible idea. And just because, as you said, you have a little holiday in that, in that gold plate and you just all the current from the galvanic current just drills a hole right through it, okay? And Bob says, terrible idea. And they, they said, well, but this was an MD who came up with this idea. And Bob says, still a bad idea. This is sort of like Bethlehem Steel, you know, with the rebar. Some manager came up with the idea. So they said, well, we want to have a meeting. So Bob had to fly to New York. But he had them make one of them before he went. The meeting was on a Monday morning. And they get in this conference room and this MD gets up and starts lecturing all the attorneys and doctors and businessmen on corrosion and how gold is non-toxic in the body and has excellent corrosion resistance in the body, which it does, very good resistance to chlorides. And Bob, you know, the MIT professor of material science is sitting there listening and, and uh, so he then this pompous MD, but I guess that's redundant. Um, sits down and says, what do you think of that? And so Bob Rose gets up and says, well, I actually took one of these and I put it last Friday in a jar of saline. And he reaches in a briefcase, he pulls out this jar of saline solution with a valve and it's all black and murky, okay? Because over the weekend, the thing had just started to corrode. And Bob says everyone got sick and walked out and that was the end of that project, okay? Dumb idea, okay? I'll give you another example. Back when copper was getting very expensive, about the early 70s, um, mid 70s, they built a, well, copper is getting expensive and they wanted to find a steel company, wanted to find a stainless steel company, wanted to find a new market and get into water pipe, okay? Copper water pipe for potable water and, and stuff. So they decided, well, the problem with stainless pipe, might be a little pipe like this, very thin wall. Uh, if it was stainless, it was you can't solder to it. So they decided, oh, we'll just plate copper to the outside and then the plumbers can solder to it. it. Solves that problem. So they made some of it and they made test loops, ran them through for a year. They ran them through these tests, ran water through them, no problem, okay? So they built a $40 million condominium on the coast, in, down in, on the Gulf Coast in Hawaii, not Hawaii, in Florida. Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast of Florida. And within two years, they had a sprinkler system in the building, okay? They tested the corrosion on the inside where the stainless was, and stainless is, you have the right grade of stainless, it's pretty good corrosion resistance to potable water. It doesn't have a lot of chlorides and stuff. But they never checked the outside for corrosion resistance. It was a laboratory environment, and everyone had made good solder joints. No one had any leaks or anything. And they didn't have any condensation on the cold water that would bring in salt air that had chlorides in it. And I took some of those. I was either a graduate student or a young assistant professor trying to survive on assistant professor's salary with uh, three children, whatever. And Bob let me do some consulting. And we took the, those copper clad stainless steel and we put it in saline, 100 ppm water, okay, which is the EPA limit for potable water in terms of chlorides. Typically in Cambridge you got 5 ppm chlorine. 
What if you go to San Antonio or Las Vegas or somewhere in Florida where they don't have nice clean rivers and stuff? I mean, they've got the Colorado and Las Vegas, right? Um, and it's got a lot of chlorine in it. it. The EPA limit is 100 ppm chloride. So we, I, I may took some distilled water, put 100 ppm chlorine in it, stuck it halfway through, and within 24 hours we could perforate the stainless steel. Okay, in 100 ppm water. Uh, I didn't have to add anything. All I had was water-like corrosion. So you had a little bit of air, oxygen from the air, 100 ppm chlorine. You had the noble copper with pinholes in the stainless, in the copper plating, and all the current from the cathodic copper went through those pinholes as the anode and just just drilled a hole, like focusing a, you know, focusing the sun on an ant, right? Just just cut right through it. So oxygen and chlorine will really do a job on stainless steel. The other example I had of stainless steel corrosion is um, all through the 1980s, I used to do a lot of work for a division of Johnson Johnson down here that makes stainless steel medical instruments. And, and uh, just like uh, Craftsman tools, you can, you know, if one breaks, you can take it back and they'll replace it for free. Well, when they sell you a $300 pair of scissors in the medical business, if one breaks, just turn it in and they won't give you a free pair of scissors back. Okay, so they were sending me every return tool. And this was pretty good for my graduate students, one bad for me. I could go home write three reports a night on these things. They were all kind of the same thing. But we had this one. They sent me some stainless steel instruments. They're all pitted. And I, we did the analysis on it. I couldn't find anything wrong with this stainless that would cause the pitting. And so I called the guys down there. I said, I can't find anything wrong. I said, what kind of service was this in? And he said, well, um, sometimes hospitals at that time in the 80s People were selling them as cold sterilizing solution. Ordinarily, you had to do a steam sterilization of the instruments. And people were selling these high chloride cold sterilizing solutions. And we had seen some of that. But usually, I would pick up some very high chlorides because, I mean, my mother-in-law lived with us. She liked to do the dishes. And one time, she didn't want to wash a few of the a little bit of stainless steel and put it in the dishwasher. So she decided to sterilize it in Clorox overnight and just bottom two set of dinnerware, okay? Because oxygenated chlorides will just tear up stainless steel. Well, in this case, they said no, they weren't using cold sterilizing in the hospital. And the, the, the nurse tells this guy when he calls her up to a phone interview, and she, she says, but all the tools in Dr. So-and-so's bag are like that. He said, oh, they're not in all your tools? Oh, no, not just Dr. So-and-so's. And he says, well, what else does Dr. So-and-so have in his bag? Only his special sterilizing solution. Oh, what's that? Hydrogen peroxide in, in, in saline solution. So you got a high oxygen, high saline solution. So we took regular old stainless steel, put in his special sterilizing solution, and within 48 hours we had pits. Okay? So oxygenated chloride, just like General Electric found at very low concentrations, just like Johnson and Johnson found in this doctor's serum, you know, just like my mother in law learned, okay? You know, just like they learned that. The stainless steel company um, uh, about uh, the copper cladding on the pipes, you know. Um, uh, chlorides uh, will really do a job on stainless steel in the right concentrations. Okay. So, if they have something to be reduced with them, so if the option wasn't there, you would have been fine, right? If the option was there, now the plated stainless was even worse because the only way you can get, if you tried to take a piece of regular stainless steel that's been what we call passivated, you want to grow the chromium oxide skin. And so what you do is you, um, you stick it in nitric acid. Nitric acid is an oxidizing <coughs> acid, and it will eat away any iron on the surface. In fact, an old machinist trick, which I learned from a machinist who trained me in the laboratory, is if you're, if you're trying to tap some stainless steel part that you're machining, and you break the tap inside the hole, which is easy to do because the stainless steels are fairly tough, and sometimes you'll break the tap. Just stick it in nitric acid overnight, and you'll eat away the tap and leave the stainless behind. So nitric and stainless steel is, is not be eaten up by nitric acid. Now hydrochloric acid is another matter. Hydrochloric acid activates the surface. It will eat away the chrome oxide skin. That's why chlorides are so harmful to the stainless. They will eat away in local areas and you'll get pitting. 
But if you stick in hydrochloric acid or muriatic acid, which is commercial hydrochloric, you'll just eat away the, the, the surface and you get what's called active stainless steel as opposed to passive. Passive means it's got, it's corrosion, from a corrosion point of view, it's got a passive surface and it won't corrode. Active means it will corrode. The only way you can get the copper to adhere is on an active surface. If you try to plate to a piece of passive stainless, the plate will just peel right off, just flake right off. So in order to do it, what the steel company had to do to make that piece of stainless steel water pipe, they had to activate the surface and then plate it. So it was even worse, okay, if you actually look at it. Okay. I had a situation up here, happened to be a, a Mormon, a Latter-day Saint, and up here at the temple on Belmont Hill, they have a stainless steel baptismal font, and they were having corrosion problems. After a year, they were getting pits, and it was almost going through the eighth-inch stainless. It was like two, two and a half millimeter pits in one or two locations in an eighth-inch uh, shell. Um, and so they called me in, and I said, well, and they told me they cleaned it once a week. And I said, well, what do you clean it with? They were cleaning it with muriatic acid. And then they put a lot of um, calcium chloride in there because they wanted to make it very hard water to keep it from foaming, okay? Um, uh, when you baptize people, you know, who wants to go in foaming water? Um, and so you couldn't, you couldn't think of a worse situation. And I said, where did you get that? It turns out there was some guy who made fiberglass swimming pools in Salt Lake City, and he was advising the church. And that's a great way to clean fiberglass. You use muriatic acid, it gets all rid of all of the, the, the uh, calcium deposits. But you couldn't think of anything worse than stainless steel. So I had to teach them, I had to get some, get them some nitric acid, and they, they I first had them clean it with muriatic, and then I had them passivate it with nitric. And then we developed it so we used calcium nitrate rather than calcium chloride as the hardening agent in the, in the baptism form. No problems for the last eight years. So, and they wanted, then they wanted to repair the little hole and send out a crew and the weld it. I said, just leave it alone. No one even knows where it is. I know where it is. I'm the only, only two of us in the world know where that is. Anyway, uh, there was another story I had on getting up stainless, but I guess it's time to let you go. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.